Can you manage? Oh, oh wonderful. <laughs> In the olden days, when they built these things, they always had a grand party on top with a brass band. Like, really, this is best we can do, the old gramophone and the champagne. <laughs> you know, it's a bit sad, really, because, you know, I've knocked lots and lots of these things down, and this really is the last one to be built in Bolton. And hopefully, you know. <laughs> and long may it stand. <laughs> It's had many years of happy smoking. <laughs> <laughs> Fred Dibner's work as a steeplejack involved a lot of restoration and repair work on great mill chimneys. It gave him real first-hand knowledge of how huge structures like this had been built in the first place. By the middle of the 19th century, we were constructing some magnificent spinning mills with beautiful chimney stacks like the one behind me. This thing here is India Mill in a place called Darwin near Blackburn and it was constructed in 1875. And of course, when it was first built, it was even more ornate than it is now. It had loads of beautiful ironwork round top, which were removed in 1936, I think. Really, I think the man who designed it must have been to Venice, you know, because there's a tower there that looks almost identical. It would all be built from the inside, you know, off a platform in the middle, and as the walls went up, the platform would be moved six foot centres up the middle. But when they got to the top, you know, the great stones, you know, they know how to have a steam engine, a steam winch to pull them up because some of them, like five tonne maybe a piece. And of course the overhang, you know, and the, the, the way that they kept them in position while they got more weight on top were to put great vertical tie rods down the middle, you know, anchored into the brickwork below so that they couldn't fall off. And then they built a bit more on a bit more on a bit more. As, it, as you can see how it goes back in, there's quite a few tonne above the cantilevered coping stones or the, 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 the collar, as you might say. Very interesting, you know. I wouldn't like to try and dismantle it, you know, the same way they put it up, you know, it'd be pretty difficult. And it could unfold a picture of how the chimney were constructed. I'd say to him, look, the, the chimney's made of massive stone blocks. How the heck would they get the stone blocks up? Oh, they'd use so and so, they'd use a, a tripod on the top and it'd be all uh, hydraulic action, as you used to call it. Pulling down, guys with plenty of muscles. They'd use a horse and a pulley wheel. In later years, they'd use a miniature steam engine that they'd haul to the top and so on. The spire of Salisbury Cathedral is the biggest in all of England. And of course, being a steeplejack, I've always had a great interest in church steeples and church spires. The, the, the thing is, finally, I've come to rest my eyes on it, and I'm afraid to say it doesn't impress me as much as I thought it would. Number one, it isn't, I always thought it were 500 feet high, and it's only 404. And it doesn't really look as impressive as the one I'm presently repairing in Preston, which is 100 feet in, less in height. I think it's because the one at Preston is much narrower than, than Salisbury. That gives it this wonderful impression of great height. Because he was up there doing the work himself, Fred knew what the challenges were that faced the builders of the great cathedrals of the past. This is St Margaret's Church at Boddle Widden, near Rill in North Wales. And I've always greatly admired it, you know. Number one, they call it the Marble Church because of all the different types of marble that have been used in the interior decoration of it. You know, basically it's the same stuff outside, but the bit that I really like is the steeple, you know, the spire. It's a work of art. The man who actually designed it, you know, he must have known a lot about the material that the thing's made of, you know, because he must have known how many pounds per square inch the, them eight cornerstones would take, or else he were a bit of a gambler. And it's also a proper built steeple with a, a curve on the outside. When you stand right underneath the shadow of it and look up, you can see the distinct barrel shape of it. When you come far, far away, 
the trick of the eye, I think, you know, it's something to do with perspective. It, it disappears and goes perfectly straight and looks like a needle point. Ever since I passed by here years and years and years ago, I stopped one day and had a look at it, you know, beautiful steeple. You know, I always wanted to have a closer look and get inside like where we are now. You know. It's really interesting because you can see the eight stones up above that takes the weight of the top three quarters of the steeple. The other interesting thing is you can see where they had all the timber in the, in the walls when they built it, all the put logs across to put the platforms on as the spire progressed in an upwards direction. And if you look right up to the top, you can see the iron cross tree in the top that the great nut and bolt comes through to all the top on the steeple. I think I'll go outside now and have a look round on the uh, veranda. It just shows you really, it wasn't just industrial history, he was interested in architecture as well. Um, he just loved knowing how uh, things had been constructed. Um, and he was also fascinated with the men that actually did the work. Fred was always a great admirer of the actual ordinary sort of working man, really, and the skills that they built up in the same way that he did. It's quite beautiful, isn't it? You can see there's evidence of steeplejacking activity of long ago up there, you know, with the, the, the copper rods and the corner plates. And Mr. Furs from Nottingham. Mm. 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 You know, these lovely pinnacles on the corners with the slender supports, you know, fret worked out, and the flying buttresses that join one to the other. Uh, lovely bit of stonework, really. The fact that he, he knew what he was talking about. Uh, and the folks liked Fred for himself, and they liked the way the programme was put together, they were learning how things were done without realising it. They didn't realise that they were watching the programme to learn how these buildings were being put together. They just liked the way Fred explained it. And at the end of the day, they would go away so much the wiser. Fred served his apprenticeship as a joiner, and at Stokesay Castle in Shropshire, he was able to draw on these skills to explain the medieval construction technique of jettying. When you get up here on the, on the second floor, uh, all the walls are timber framed and filled in with lath and plaster. It must have been a very important room, you know, for the family. And, and of course, if you had any friends around, there's wonderful views of all the countryside out through these lovely windows. But you must have felt a bit vulnerable if there were any enemies about. I rather think that when this bit was stuck on top of here, you know, there were more peaceful times. This timber framing, this window frame that I'm stood in, protrudes out as much as four feet over the stone walls down below. It, it's a, a technique developed in the Middle Ages known as jettying. And of course, this North Tower here at Stokesy Castle is, is one of the earliest examples of it. Joists of the beams used to support a floor or the floorboards. With this business of jetting, they actually protrude over the wall, which I'm stood in the area where immediately below me there's the outer stone wall of the, of the tower proper. And then there's about four feet of the joist protruding out into space. But when I stand over here, I'm actually stood on top of the moat, you know, there's nothing in between me and the moat, only these floorboards. I could really show you better uh, if we went downstairs and, and outside and climbed up the ladder to underneath the jetty. Like really, the, the idea of the jetting is you can get a room maybe, maybe as much as eight or nine feet bigger than you would inside the actual stone walls, with the stone walls being very thick and the, and the timber framing being very thin with the, with the lats and plaster inserts in between. You, you, you can really see why they did it. You know, they could gain maybe as much as four, four or five feet all the way around the room, which is quite a big item. Uh, it must have been a bit drafty because you can see great quarter-inch gaps in the floorboards, you know. <laughs> Had thick carpets down, they must have. Had. The 
the joists, the, the actual floor joists are the ones horizontal sticking out. They go straight across inside from one wall to the other. And then there's the stone corbels with the vertical props, which are braced by these 45 degree members, which in turn are tenoned, mortise and tenoned into each end and pegged. So they give the final overhang a bit of extra support, as you might say. I think as F Fred developed his TV programmes, one of the big changes I saw was from here's something that's interesting to here's how you should do it or how it worked. And I remember clearly his, his descriptions of how people built cathedrals, which I thought I knew about until he was able to explain them. And I'm sure that got over to a huge number of people who'd never really thought about it before. The thing that distinguishes these great Norman cathedrals from the Saxon buildings that they replaced is the sheer size and scale of them. And of course the Normans brought what these ideas and building techniques all the way from France and of course left us with these magnificent pillars and arches. Fred takes us to the heart of buildings. He shows us not just the grand scale of places like Ely Cathedral, but then he helps us to understand how they were constructed, how they're still standing today. We, we take so much for granted about our, our great cathedrals, our great castles, our great palaces, but he shows us the men and women who helped to build them bit by bit, make them beautiful. This is a demonstration of uh, building an arch. Yeah, the, the wooden bit in the middle, like this bit down here, is what's known as the centering, you know, and of course, when the thing's set, we can withdraw these wedges down here, and hopefully the, the wood will come slack, and then, you know, and the arch will stay in, in position. You know. You're, um, it's. I'm, I'm very confident that it will, it will stay in, in position. Uh, I'm not worried about it at all. Uh, so, even though it's waddling about now. <laughs> yeah. Now we'll come back after dinner and take the middle <laughs> and hopefully it'll stay up. I'm fairly confident I think it will do. Because I'm not really a bricklayer, you know, it's, I'm only a sort of uh, self taught mechanic in a way. You know. Right. Well, that's what all good bricklayers do at brew time. I'm off now. We'll come back after lunch and take the middle out. This is it, the great moment. We're now going to strike the arch. Success! <laughs> I don't know what Mr. Brunel had have thought about it, but uh, I'm quite pleased. Um, yeah. Uh, um, it looks terribly fragile in its present state, but if you imagine it being contained at the bottom and at 10 2 and 10 past and on the top, the more pressure you put on the thing and the stronger it becomes. I'm going to attempt to sit on top of it and see what happens. I don't think it'll fall down, but you never know. You know? Um, here we go. <laughs> I can't really get high enough up, you know. Um, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> well, as you can see, that was one arch down at ground level. The, the thing is that you basically you get the principle or the idea 
if only they actually built arches from that disaster. If I'd have used a bit more cement in the mortar, it would have stayed up, you know. But I mean, how did they go on building something like this behind me, you know, like three tiers of arches, you know, and all quite slender, really, you know. Must have waited a fair time for the mortar to go off before they struck the centering out, you know, but not quite like what we did. You know. <laughs> <laughs> His particular contribution uh, was in conveying and explaining in a really immediate way how things were put together. I mean, I've seen several television programmes uh, on which people have uh, tried to explain the principle of a Gothic vault, uh, but Fred's the only person I've ever seen actually building one in his back garden. I think that was particularly good. And there's the other one where he, he demonstrates with, like, model crane how the, how the lantern of Edie Cathedral was put together. This magnificent lantern which is over 200 feet high and weighs 200 tons made of wood and lead and is hanging over precariously over this great void. This, this really is my personal idea of how they managed to get it up all them years ago. To raise up these great bulks of timber, which I think are about 60 or foot long, there'd be maybe 50 or 60 blocks you know, on the end of the rope that control the actual set of rope blocks that raised the, the real weight of the thing. And of course, as it came up, it would have other guy ropes on and men pulling the bottom out and the, keeping the top roughly in the right shop. And when they got it in a position where they could anchor it to the stonework, the, the next stage of the game would be everybody would be holding onto the ropes while some intrepid character crept out onto the, uh, onto the sort of stonework and shoved in the big iron pin. This would have to be sort of repeated eight times all the way around the, uh, or 16 times really, because there's, there's two for every corner. And of course the next piece would come up in the same manner with the rope box. And here again, somebody would have to pin it to the, uh, the masonry. Um, and then, like when, when, with the aid of a couple of planks chucked out on, on here for somebody to go out on, It'd be pretty easy to secure the corner there together, so you see how real strong it is. I'm pressing down fairly hard on this corner, and there's not a lot happening, you know, it's pretty tough. So if they did that 16 times all the way around, it would be easy then to lace it all up with planks from one to the other, and then construct what I've called the foundation ring for the lantern proper. Once they'd reached that stage, They'd, they'd reached a stage of stability where they'd realised the thing couldn't collapse. Up until then, it must have been very precarious and they must have been a bit, uh, you know, excited and uptight while they were doing it. I know if I had to do it, I would. I mean, really, you can't, you, you can't compare it so well with modern steel structures because, you know, you can cantilever out for miles, you know, like the fourth bridge, but I mean, things like this. They didn't really know whether it was going to start creaking and collapse or not, till I reckon they'd got that big octanal shape ring in. It's a matter that was very good at looking and understanding. Um, approached the uh, technology of the medieval carpenters who put up the octagon at Ely Cathedral. And quite clearly he's really in there, getting into their thought processes, understanding how they had put those things together um, and what sort of machines they needed to, to, to make it work and how they put a rope here and a rope there and what order they'd put those great timbers up in, in just the same way as he would be understanding how uh, an engineer would assemble a steam engine. I think that's a lovely thing to be able to do. Really a simple way to explain it all is, is like a crossroads. And if you imagine houses coming up to each corner of the crossroads and, and something shoving on the bottom corners of them, you've got to shove a row of houses out the way before the thing can go downwards. And in a way, down below here, we've got the nave and the transepts, which in actual fact is a crossroads. And of course, the main thrust is on the end corners of the walls. So you've got to shove out the way, the wall length of the cathedral in a way. I mean, it never come to that, but that's in theory what it is before this lot can actually descend. It's all very cleverly done, really, you know. When you think it's so old and, and what have you, that it's a credit to them how they managed to do it, you know, all for the glory of God. And he very often said, 
That's the thing that I liked about him. He said, that's a great credit to them. And you felt that, that he really meant it. And there was somebody who centuries before had created this thing and he was there appreciating it. Yeah. Well, anyway, Jonathan, no, tell me which is Cardinal Wolsey's bit. <laughs> right, Fred. Now, from that gable... Yeah. ..and the gatehouse to the other gable, yeah. that's all Wolsey's material. Yeah. And then Henry VIII added um, these arms. That one's actually yeah. a toilet for 28 mm. people. This wonderful diagonal... Sort of uh, uh, blue brick. Work. It's like quite beautiful, one, and yet it is. If you look closely at the Tudor stuff, though, you yeah. see it doesn't quite carry through yeah, well, the whole I, facade. I've, I've been straining my eyes at it. It's all a little bit different. Isn't it, it is, it? yeah. It's There's very no regular. There's no proper symmetry about it, is there? No. Yeah, and then of course this new brickwork in the middle. What? What? Uh, how come that's nice and pink, isn't it? Yeah, now, alarm like bells a, ring, of course, when you see a, yeah, a completely yeah, different colour of brick. A, a rebuild and of some sort. It is. It's an 18th century uh, rebuild and reface of that gatehouse because it seems that Wolsey built too quickly for his foundations yeah. to last long. Mm -hmm. And originally that gatehouse had two wings on each side which made the centre part the lower. And mm -hmm. they were taken down in 1777 mm -hmm. after cracks were seen. And so now it's reversed its original appearance. It looks like yeah. a podium now, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the chimney stacks, and they're somewhere else, aren't they? <laughs> Every one different. Now, none of them are Tudor, the yeah. ones that you see, but they're faithful copies of the Tudor designs. Mm. I wonder how they got them, like, saw that beautiful twist on them, you know, that's an interesting thing, you know, they... they uh, well, I read somewhere about a stick, you know, mm. the middle. That, I yeah. think that's the way they build them. They put yeah. a pole in the middle yeah. and a template on, they just move the template around. Yeah. Yeah. Because you only need about um, two or three types of brick. Yeah. It's actually yeah. very economical yeah. to get a spiral, you yeah. just move the yeah. next course around a bit. Yeah, it's a good way of doing that. It's quite simple and practical, isn't it, if you think about it? Isn't it? Extremely yeah. effective, though. Yeah. And yeah. made a wonderful skyline. I think when all the pinnacles were there, all the mm. lead caps on the turrets, mm. it must have been a wonderful mm. view from afar. Yeah. Uh, with gilding and on the top. And all as well. painted as well, eh? Mm. Sometimes when we stand in front of a, a great palace like Hampton Court, it's hard to take it all in. We, we can see it's so complex and it's built up over so many generations. So but Fred leads here, Fred, us Fred, through it. He shows us how each involved. space um, functions and the people first, who help to build it. The edge, and then, then we can understand it and we can enjoy it more. You're a man who works with your hands, Fred. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, how would you go about making something like that? Well, that particular panel, well, it, it'll be about, what is it, 12 inches by maybe 23 inches longer thereabouts would initially start off as a piece of oak uh, on a bench and the guy would, would cut in the, like vertically down the edge of the panels and they must have had a bit of a gauge for, no, they were at the right depth. Same at both ends and then the timber in between all the folds of the, would be done with like concave and convex moulding planes and sort of small grooving planes. So you, and, so you just groove the whole length yeah, and that's done yeah, in an instant. Yeah, yeah, and like the latest, that looks to me as though it could have been done same as masonry with an hammer and chisel, you know, because yeah. it's all a bit, bit up and down -ish. I see, right. But that, that's the sort of effect to, to get it to look like folded off material. Oh, uh, I had a friend once, uh, God bless him, he's dead and gone now, but he, he actually played the fiddle in the Alley Orchestra, really? but he was a budding woodworker and he, his favourite timber were oak. And before he died, he often promised me that he would learn me how to make linen fall panelling. Mm. And he did all his house with it, you know, it was quite magnificent, the doors <laughs> and the panelling and everything. It very effective and um, looked very nice. Well, this is Henry VIII's bit, is it? Well, this yeah. hall was rebuilt by Henry VIII on the site of Wolsey's. I'm yeah. researching that at the moment, and it mm -hmm. seems almost certain that Wolsey's hall was actually longer, bigger by area. Yeah. It's um, 39 foot wide and 114 foot long. Yeah. And, um, and this was the great ceremonial entrance room, so mm -hmm. um, it's decked with tapestries, each of which would cost uh, as much as an armed battleship to make. Oh, man, About four years. <laughs> so this is a, real, this is a show off yeah. room, it's a design yeah, to impress yeah. you. Yeah. I mean, this magnificent roof is, is summer, isn't it? it? And I've always thought that they designed that because they couldn't get any big lumps of timber, really. I mean, if you think of the size of an oak tree, you know, it's compared with, like, later yeah. architectural feats of, you know, big in engineering works is with 60-foot-long beams, you know. I mean, there's no bit of wood up there that's more than maybe 10 feet or 12-foot long, isn't it? You're limited by the length of trunk. That, mm. a, that a tree yeah, provide for yeah. a beam. And if you imagine spanning 40 feet like this, mm. you'd need a beam of, you know, immense yeah. oh, depth yeah. if, well, you, if you could I've find it. I've seen that myself in industrial 
premises in Lancashire, mm. you know, uh, to get across here, it would be maybe two feet deep right. by nine inches thick I with, with a right. queen post and two vertical uh, posts. Yeah. And, heavily braced up with iron rods to yeah. accomplish the same thing. And if you, if you imagine the, the, the feeling of lightness and space you want to get within this hall, if you have beams yeah. coming across, mm. you've spoilt it mm. uh, um, already, I think. Mm. And Westminster Hall in the 1390s, they pioneered this technique mm -hmm. of using a hammer beam and, and um, building it straight out from the wall, like mm. a cantilever. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So that can support then Another a vault yeah, you know, yeah. just yeah. over the mm. central section of the roof, yeah. so it's very yeah. light. Mm. Uh, construction looks uh, like the underside of a ship, mm. perhaps. Yeah, yeah, and when it is all bolted together, the weight's basically straight down on the walls yeah. instead of trying to shove them out. It is, it's, it's a very elegant engineering mm. solution, mm. I think. Mm. And this is one of the latest because Westminster mm. was 1390s, mm -hmm. this is 1530s. Yeah, so yeah. it's quite late mm. on in, in history. Yeah, a bit before they used to build a stone arch across, didn't they? And then you know, put the timber on top of that. Well, there's a variety, think. sometimes they did, a variety yeah. of timber um, mm. um, trusses, well, but most yeah. of them are far less elegant than this. Oh, and all, yeah, yeah. this is beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah. I think it's Henry VIII's best piece of building <coughs> here, certainly. Yeah. He would actually show with practical demonstrations how timber beams worked, for example, and how uh, it was a, a very precise art, uh, and something which I think people tended not to notice before. They tended to look at things and say, oh gosh, you know, well the ceiling's up there, rather than, isn't it clever how that is all kept together? I remember, uh, I, I suppose because I'm quite interested in it myself, the whole business of hammer beam roofs. He actually made a hammer beam uh, joint on one occasion. Uh, and uh, I remember the slight nerves he managed to exhibit, I'm sure he wasn't feeling them at the time, of hammering in the last pin and, and saying, you know, once this goes in, it won't come out. And he proved it. He made a, a very good locking joint uh, and made the point of how these great roofs do hang together. In, in the Middle Ages, like the, the roof construction, like hammer beam roofs and crook beam constructions, the main joint really in all of it were the mortise and tenon joint which is basically an hole in one bark of wood and a, and a bit sawn on the end of the other that fits in the hole. And the tools needed to form such a joint are fairly simple. A chisel and a hammer. <laughs> and then, of course, a saw for sawing the, the tenon on the end of the beam. And then, of course, it's held together by a, a dowel or a peg and if you drill the, the hole slightly out of centre so that when you put the tenon down the mortise hole and knock the peg through, the peg has a pulling effect on the shoulders of the tenon and, and pulls it all together. And that's what I'm about to undertake to do now. That goes in there like that. And then we've got the, this beam. The hole is slightly out of line so when I knock this wooden peg in here it'll have the effect of pulling the tenon down into the into the mortise hole and of course once we have knocked it in we won't be able to get it out so here goes that feels very good and very tight and uh, I think it's solid as a rock <coughs> um, no daylight, uh, slightly out of square, but I think it's I think it's the fact that that side of the timber's round, because on this side it's flush all the whole way over. Even for Middle Ages, that would be a pretty good joint, uh, I think. Anyway. <laughs>